I want you to imagine you're standing on Calvary as Jesus is being crucified. There's a lot to take in, isn't there? Different sights, different smells. But for a moment, I want you to just focus on the sounds. What do you hear? You're standing there on Calvary. What do you hear? Well, you're going to hear a, a, a cacophony of voices all around you, aren't you? The first voices you're going to notice are coming from the Jewish leaders. Yeah, after all, they seem to have the most to say, right? He saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from that cross, and then we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now, if God wants him so much. For, for he said himself, I am the son of God. Sad, isn't it? The trials are over. The, the, the death sentence being carried out, which is what they wanted. But still, in their hatred of Jesus, they can't help themselves. In their hatred, their hatred is so strong, they're still sarcastically demanding that he provide evidence for his claim. Now, the next voices you'll hear, remember, we're imagining. The next voices you'll hear, they're coming from the soldiers beneath the cross, right? If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. I mean, evidently, these guys aren't finished having fun at Jesus' expense. Now, now you notice voices that are coming from the road, right? The road that passes by the crucifixion site. That, that's just people on their way to work, people on their way to the market. This is just a bunch of kind of nosy looky-loos, and they're all out there chiming in from the road. You who are going to destroy the temple, build it in three days, save yourself, come down from that cross if you are the Son of God. It's kind of disgusting, isn't it? I mean, what moves a bystander? who's just passing by, what moves him to, to shout out at a dying man like that? Now, finally, finally, imagine that you pick out those two voices that are coming from above you. And you look up, and you see that the men on either side of Jesus are saying the same things, right? Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. A little selfish desperation mixed in with mockery. The voices that you hear, right? I imagine, we imagined all these voices. The voices that you hear, they're, they're coming from all different people in all different tones from all different places, aren't they? But they're all swelling into one diabolical course with one clear theme, which is prove it. If you're really God, if you really are the Son of God, prove it. Show us. And you know what? Still today, or even today, you can hear the echoes of those voices directed at God, directed at his people, or directed at no one in particular, right? You know what it sounds like? If there is a God, well, where's the proof? You know, why can science, the God of science, explain everything and we don't need God for that explanation? Why is there so much evil in the world, huh? Answer that. Why do prayers go unanswered? You know, God, if, if you're really up there, well, make things better for me. You know, give me a sign so that I'll believe. Yeah, just like at Calvary, those voices, they're, they're coming from all kinds of different places, aren't they? Some of those are being spoken in hatred by people determined to fight against a God they can't stand. Others are uttered with the singular goal of kind of poking fun at, at our expense. Some reveal a, a skepticism that shakes its head at Christianity's claims, and, and some some have a ring of desperation to them, right? As if the, the speaker would love to be wrong. You know, just please pr prove me wrong. Yeah, in other words, the people of the world today, they continue to put God on trial. They continue to demand to see evidence. Well, you hear those voices. How do they affect you? Now again, let's go back to Golgotha. I want you to picture yourself there at Golgotha again, not as a fly on the wall, uh, but as a disciple, put yourself in one of the disciple's shoes, Peter or John. All those voices all around you. How do those voices make you feel? Maybe angry, right? Now, how dare you say those things about my Lord? Maybe those voices make you frustrated. You, know, you don't understand. You don't understand who he really is. I've seen it. Then again, though, you might also be wondering if the voices are right. You know, why... Why isn't Jesus doing anything? You know, I, I've seen Jesus multiply loaves. I've seen him heal the blind. I've seen him raise the dead. Why is he not coming down from the cross? 
is this maybe too much even for Jesus? Is, is, is maybe Jesus not the one I thought he was? I mean, folks, you don't think the disciples were thinking any of those things or, or maybe all of those things? And you know what? There's nothing new under the sun. All these centuries later and all the calls for proof from all around us, they begin to affect us today in much the same way, right? If Jesus is the Son of God, well, then why did he let this tragedy happen to me? Why doesn't Jesus stop his enemies who are tormenting me? Why doesn't he give, give some kind of proof, some kind of sign? Why does he just stay quiet? Why doesn't he do something? Why doesn't he do, you know, do anything? So, yeah, you know, I mean, from our own sinful hearts, particularly from our own selfish desperation and doubt, even our voices sometimes join the course, don't they? And Satan, the, uh, the unseen director, he smiles, he rejoices. But you know what? The solution here isn't to simply ignore the voices raised against Jesus. No. In fact, if you listen more closely, we'll notice that those first voices, they were actually on to something. So don't ignore it. Listen to it. You know, what did those first voices say? The voices of the, the Pharisees. They say, he saved others. You know, if only they had set aside their spite for just a moment, they might have followed up with the right question, right? He saved others, so why doesn't he save himself? See, what they didn't consider was the fact that uh, Jesus was refraining from using his power for a reason. That, that never crossed their minds. You know, why didn't the man, why, why wouldn't the man who could raise the dead, why didn't he save his own life? You know what, for all our why questions, Jesus had one too. But his why question, it's actually meant to be an answer for us. All right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? From the, that, that's for us. All right? From the midst of that hellish wrath, the, the true hell of being forsaken by God, it's from the midst of that wrath that Jesus cries out in faith to his God. God may have forsaken Jesus, but Jesus didn't forsake his God. So that cry of forsakenness, that's not a cry of unbelief. It's a cry of agony. That cry reveals what no one standing there could see. You know, the man on that middle cross, he wasn't just suffering from lacerations and nails and thirst and suffocation you know, on top of the ridicule. No, this man who had done nothing wrong in the court of humankind or in the court of God, this man was suffering God's wrath for the sin of others. So his question it comes from the depths of the torment that we deserved. The one who saved others didn't save himself. You know why? Because he loves us. See, that's the answer to all the why questions that plague us. You know, why doesn't Jesus do whatever? Why, why would Jesus allow whatever? Well, if he was willing to suffer and die in our place, folks, you can't doubt his love for you. Would he be abandoned by God for us only to later abandon us? Does that make sense? Would he meticulously follow every commandment? Would he, you know, fulfill every prophecy, forgive every sin? Would he do all that only to later make a mistake in our lives? So yeah, the answer to all our questions remains the same. It must be because he loves us. Now, that may not be the answer we want, but that's the answer we need. And not everyone on that hill was blind to this fact. Matthew tells us that the two thieves also joined in the course, but Luke tells us in his gospel that one of those thieves later repented and turned to Jesus in faith. What moved that thief to turn from mocking Jesus to defending Jesus? Now, it certainly wasn't any display of power, was it? Whatever it was, we can say that it was the Holy Spirit working not through some mighty miracle, but through a suffering servant. And Jesus still works in us the same way today. 
by a simple baptismal washing. He puts his spirit in us to convince us that he is our Savior. And it's through time-worn words that he speaks to us the same forgiveness, the same promise of paradise. It's here at the altar, right, in an unassuming meal. Here he lets us touch and taste Exhibit A, which is the very body and blood that he gave for us. These sacramental means, these bring Jesus' death to us to forgive our doubts and, yes, to put all those doubts to rest. Now, of course, the skeptics in our world, and hey, even the skeptic in our own little heart from time to time, the skeptics will all say, you know, maybe God doesn't help us because he can't. Maybe there are no signs, you know, because there's no God. Maybe, maybe this is all just a waste of time. I mean, that sounds like those voices are on the cross, doesn't it? And God had another answer for them. Right? At that moment, God wasn't done yet. They wanted proof, and God actually gave them proof. At the moment Jesus died, the temple curtain was torn in two. The earth shook, the rocks split, the tombs broke open, the dead came to life. These were all enough proofs and evidence you know, for the Roman centurion, the pagan Roman centurion, the pagan soldiers, this was enough for them to acknowledge that, you know, Jesus must have been the Son of God. And as you know, this was just a preview, right? The clincher would come three days later at the empty tomb. But this display of power, this Good Friday display of power, this removes any last thought that Jesus couldn't be the Son of God that he claimed to be. Eyewitnesses, i.e. friends and foes alike, they saw all of this and they testified to all of it. Their accounts were recorded with the Holy Spirit stamp of approval, preserved for us today in the Gospels. There's no question that the one on trial, the one suffering and dying, there is no question that he is our God. Therefore, then, there's no question that Jesus is our Savior. Tonight, he gives us that very proof. Amidst a course of voices demanding evidence, the, the silent suffering of the Son of God, that's all the evidence we need, isn't it? His refusal to save himself, that's proof of his determination to save us, proof of his love for us. He cries out to his God to prove to us that he suffered every lick of hell for us. He confidently entrusts his spirit to his Father as proof to us that his work is finished. And then the Father shakes the world to confirm it. So yeah, it's here on Golgotha that Jesus gives us all the evidence we need. Amen.